Hi guys, it's morning. It's just look. Um, I'm putting up a video in continuation of a next video that I I put up a few weeks ago called um, "Flat Earth Gets Weird." Um, when I was showing you the mummified bodies of fairies and all those other stuff, so um, I'm putting I'm I'm putting up the full story on that on that video so i hope you all enjoy and write in comments let me know what you all think merrill encrypted museum part one home mimicillatus larva non -bilucris, is a species of wingless homomimus which shares much of its anatomical traits with its winged relative examples of them are scarce and mainly resigned to folklore blamed for missing objects in the houses of 12th century peasants. They were often dubbed borrowers for their kleptomania, although rats and mice were a more obvious culprit. Constant references to people of diminutive stature fill the annals of many an occultist's memoirs. Larva non volucris was in fact not a separate species of fairy, but a caste within the hive, foot soldiers if you will born wingless with specific tasks to collect food, kill possible threats or seek out new nesting sites. Marilyn witnessed this in the Amazon, around the time he identified various other human mimics that fell under his broad umbrella of homomimus. Although many of these species were not related, they shared these unique humanoid attributes. Whilst tracking a number of larvae non volucris he noticed that they appeared to be returning from a hunt to a nest. When he saw that the nest was covered in settled winged homomimus, he concluded that they were about to attack. Yet to his surprise they entered the peculiar spout at the base of the mess and disappeared, only to appear again an hour later, exchanging pheromones with winged and wingless alike, and amongst their entourage, a queen fairy, her wings massive in comparison to those around her. He realized that this queen was relocating, either a recent newborn ready to make a new colony, or perhaps the nest was threatened. A day later, it was abandoned. On closer inspection Marilyn found that the nest was plagued by some kind of fungal growth, hence the evacuation. He followed the procession to a new nesting site and with much excitement studied the construction of their second home. A mixture of a mucus-like excretion and leaf litter was used for the walls, the entire hive engaged in the task. Sadly, upon waking one morning, he found that construction had ceased. The ground was littered with the bodies of the fairies, they had succumbed to the spore spread by the fungi in the previous nest. He collected them and a number of them are presented here, showing the life cycle of this species. The prospect of caste systems within fairy hives fascinated him and he wished to find examples in his own country. On his return to England, he visited a number of homes which had reported sightings of these borrowers, and although it appeared that the species was no longer present in the British Isles, evidence of their hives remained. In the excavation of an outbuilding at the Rushley Estate in Penningbourne, Marilyn found a massive nest built within the cavity wall. At its center treasure trove of human objects, thimbles, pens, ribbons and coins. These were piled haphazardly within the chamber of the Queen. Like magpies they appeared attracted to colorful or shiny objects and presented them to their majesty. Although fairy intelligence was like that of a bee or osp, the bond between the regent and her subjects was very strong. Many species are known to collect objects, such as octopi, or various species of bird for courtship ritual or bonding, so this was not completely without precedent. These examples show the pupil stage of fairy development, a newborn, the preserved skeletal remains, two examples of wingless homonymous and a very young queen. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos. Merrill Encrypted Museum, Part 2, Succubi. The cleric Abramo translated two texts from the Library of Venus. It was his life's work and was possibly the most difficult task he had ever undertaken. The books were written over a period of 6,000 years by the great thinker Glue, one of the first vampire. His words were the basis of the language of the vampire, known as Esot. Over the millennia the language evolved and so any system of decoding would have to be rethought every few chapters, 
and left alone in his task, Abramo struggled a great deal in his attempts to finally unravel the ideology of the secretive culture. In the late 18th century, an oil prospector in Texas found a series of caves below his land. He cursed this bad luck but decided to attempt to drill beneath this unfortunate void. Within the caverns, he found no sign of oil, but a faint orange light that seemed to phosphoresce in the dark. On closer inspection, the light emanated from huge stone masses that descended from the ceiling in conical forms. The lights were very faint, but sure enough, scattered the entire surface of the cones. As his eyes adjusted to the light, he noticed that these strange stone growths were actually collections of ossified bodies, hundreds of small childlike figures, huddled together, and the light seemed to come from their chests, two oblong amber shapes beneath the leather-like skin. He dug his pick into one and watched the liquid drain from the corpse. He dipped his finger in the resin and felt a bizarre sensation, one of great invigoration, a sense of well-being and strength. He collected a little of the substance and ingested it. Two weeks passed and he had harvested an entire column of the strange mummified creatures that hung like stalactite mausoleum from his cave ceiling. His addiction to the substance which he called furnace had got the better of him and its physical effect was noticeable. To all intents and purposes, furnace was a form of adrenaline, with the qualities of a steroid. He was now collecting barrels of the glands from the presumed dead creatures and selling it at a huge price to townsfolk. It was soon common knowledge that a far greater wealth than oil could be found beneath the plains of Texas, and soon he was offered more money than he could ever wish for, for the land he now owned. But what he had found was not a boon. The creatures themselves were not dead, but in a state of suspended animation, and the glands stored a substance that would not only allow them to awaken but also to power their first flight. Four times this creature had awoken since the dawn of life on the planet. In 280 million years, they had changed very little, existing in a state of serenity and peace as they slept, all of them part of cerebral network of thought that transcended our own understanding of existence, and all of them aware. And at the apex of their culture, the matriarch, the one blue feared, the great receiver, through her the universe sings its agonizing song. They wanted only for two things, to sleep and be part of the lattice of thought, and to feed. And when they fed, they would gorge until there was nothing left, and then descend into the bowels of the earth and dream again for eternity. They are the succubi, and they will awaken. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos. Merrill Encrypted Museum, Part 3, Draco Alatus. 14th century Mongolia saw the death of the presumed last remaining male Draco Alatus or Wind Dragon. With a dwindling matriarchal society with no males, this species would be one of many to face extinction at the hands of man. Hunted for nothing more than fear, Draco Alatus, along with its wingless cousin were the only other surviving Saurischia post the KT extinction, 65 million years ago. Carrying the membrane-winged attributes of the Tyrosaur with a thropod-hipped pelvis, Draco Alatus survived in remote far eastern areas seemingly unaffected by the mass extinction. Along with the dinosaurs which would eventually evolve into birds, Draco Alatus thrived in the 65 million years before man could become the force it is today. Draco Alatus was one of a small subgroup of Thropoda which carried a unique self-igniting glandular secretion. In the throat were four glands containing an enzyme, when sprayed from the mouth, reacted with oxygen and ignited. According to the little research that is known, these bizarre pyrotechnics are unique to this species, and were used in courting and mating rituals. Many preserved dragon skins carry thick burn scars on their flanks, which clotted and healed in various bizarre patterns, not unlike keloid scarring in some human practices. Their skin is like that of a rhino yet accented with tough scale-like plates along the spine. Their wingspan at adult size was around 80 feet. Their society was female-dominated, males being surprisingly smaller than the females. They are completely featherless, unlike most of their Saurian cousins. The Merrill encrypted collection added the head of a juvenile male Draco, and the bodies of several stillborn infants in 1876, 
after tracking down a remote group of Buddhist monks living in Gurkhahimal, Nepal. They were entirely cut off from civilization and practiced a form of Buddhism known as Agni, Sanskrit for fire. To the surprise of the explorers, the monks revealed a large flock of Draco Alatus living on the south side of a large mountain range. Dressed in colored fabrics and bridles, the dragons seemed almost domesticated. They were fed on flocks of cattle in the lower plains, seemingly deified by the monks. A young male had died earlier that year from a birth defect, and along with various stillborns, were buried near the monastery. To the horror of the monks, the explorers dug up and stole the head of the animal and the stillborn for their western benefactor. On receiving this piece, Marilyn himself returned to the monastery later that year to see these creatures in the flesh. The entire enclave and flock had vanished, leaving little evidence that they had ever existed. It is presumed that they left to find a more isolated place to continue their worship of these majestic beasts. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos. Merrill Encrypted Museum, Part 4, Home of Vampirus The vampire is an offshoot of Australopithecus, much like our shared distant cousin the lycanthrope. Both species are symbiotic hominids, carrying transferable immunoefficiency pathogens, viruses abundant in the blood and saliva that can be transferred to human and non-human hosts, where these unique genetic traits are inserted into the DNA of the infected taking on the characteristics of each species. Homo vampirus, is a nocturnal hominid with a huge dependency on iron and protein. Frances Gerber, Swiss-born physician, botanist, chemist and naturalist, whose prolific writings focused on the study of the origins of humanity. His own research began around 1776, where he commissioned African poachers to bring him specimens of the great apes which he dissected in an attempt to construct a detailed inventory of terrestrial and arboreal apes and their aesthetic and anatomical similarities to the Homo sapiens. His research garnered a great deal of criticism, yet most of his work was completed in private. One of his many employees would present him with a shipment of species from Sub-Saharan Africa, the Amazon and parts of India. Yet it was a bone fragment that piqued Gerber's interest in the lesser-known hominids. On December 14, 1780, Gerber unpacked a collection of specimens from the Far East. Amongst these samples was a partial skull fragment of the upper mandible and part of the brow. The teeth were intact, and clearly very unique. The upper cuspids were distended and serrated and although in a state of decay, connected to the bone tissue by a complex musculature, which allowed the teeth to protrude and retract from two fissures in the jaw. His hasty communications to the collector he had bought the pieces from, pointed to a village on the eastern shore of Lake Baikal, in Mongolia. He traveled to this destination, a destitute collection of huts nestled in the icy inlet of the great body of water. It was here he was introduced to a man, whose daughter had been murdered by what the villagers called a blood thief. He asked for a place to examine the body, which was provided. It was here he made his first examination of what he coined the nocturnal hominid, or Homo vampirus a primate whose body appeared augmented by a form of parasitic virus. His studies of the osteology, and organs provided ample proof that this body was in fact not human at all. He soon collected a wealth of knowledge, and most importantly revolutionized the study of hemoglobin, through invention of sophisticated microscope apparatus. He was fascinated by the behavior of vampire blood cells and managed to dispel the myth that these creatures only fed on human blood. Around 1836, 50 miles outside Rome, he was confronted with a child that displayed no supernatural affliction, besides heavy wounds to her neck and stomach. Her labored breathing spoke of something far worse than the medieval superstitions that filled the book he held close to him. On the 20th day, he found her dead. He sought out the weapons of defense and began a pilgrimage, to slay the beast who had taken this child's life. But the story did not end here. As he followed the path of death across the villages and towns of Italy, up into northeast Europe, he learned of his quarry. On a fateful night at the apex of his journey, as he spied the vile culprit stalking a sheep, a presence who had followed the cleric for many days made himself known. A tall pale man, dressed in bizarre clothing that was reminiscent of feudal Japan, stood before him. 
He told Abramo that his name was Dervold, of the house of Demoklev. He was a vampire, who had been sent to find the feral murderer who Abramo hunted himself. Dervold spoke of his respect for the cleric, and wished him to know of the real culture that hid behind the demon of folklore. The cleric agreed. They traveled for many weeks, only by night, until they reached the Altai Mountains of Mongolia. They reached the zenith of the path, an opening in the mountainside, and within, a seemingly endless cavern. Before them lay a city. It was pale, lifeless yet utterly beautiful, as though constructed from bleached bone and charcoal. The light seemed to hang all around yet fell from no fixed source. It people were of similar stock, like shadows of humans, drifting like skeleton leaves to and fro. This is my home, the city of the spoke the vampire. It was here that the cleric Abrahma befriended the ancient people of Venus. Built 30,000 years BC, Venus was the stronghold and citadel of the vampire nation. Built in concentric circles, around the central cathedral, Venus was a place of learning for the ancient porcelain faced Himalfaj who had lived since the dawn of their race. They possessed the knowledge of thousands of generations. They were carnivorous, dependent on high iron and protein diets, yet their lust was quenched by production of iron rich foods without resorting to blood feeding. He took this knowledge with him back to Italy, where he continued his studies. Along with various other cryptobiologists, they sought out the rarest specimens of flora and fauna, and forged cures, poisons and elixir based on their studies in the annals of Venus, the great libraries of thought. And in return, fed the old ones the information of the modern age. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos. Merrill Encrypted Museum, Part 5, Homunculi The preserved body of a gnome-like creature, presented in a fine Edwardian miniature cabinet. Homunculi, or gnome. A diminutive hominid species found in the wilds of the Arctic Circle, they are the smallest known relative of Homo sapiens. They build burrows like that of a badger, and use their large spade-like feet to dig these sets. Although their physiology is remarkably similar to us, their evolution has endowed them with some curious and fascinating traits. Homunculi were hunted to extinction for that very reason. Gnomes communicate via pheromones, released from scent glands in their hindquarters. They distinguish each other by these unique musky aromas and within these scents are a variety of emotional and physiological tells, with which the colony can communicate many gestures and needs with a single note. Sadly it became apparent that this musk is also a highly potent psychotropic substance, which is released when the animal is scared. The emissions will dull the senses of the aggressor and cause a sense of euphoria described in the Shund Almanac and Ospreeklish in Colton as a window to the other realm. Further analysis of the substance shows a very similar chemical to psilocybin, which is found in certain species of psychoactive mushroom. Ingesting this will cause psychedelic hallucinations, and rather particular to this substance, hyper-exaggerated perception of reality, described by those exposed as the fairy realm. It is important to examine other fantastical tales linked to this species. During courtship, the males develop red downy filaments upon the head and down the spine. From a distance, this shock of red can be perceived a conical shape, rather like a hat. Homunculi are also tool users, like other primate relatives, they use bone, wood and rock fragments to aid themselves, in this case, worn building. An example of a bone, chewed to a point is presented here. In the 16th and 17th century, the creatures were caught and kept in cages and cowed into releasing clouds of musk, when agitated or starved. The animals would almost certainly die from malnutrition, as one of their main sources of food is a deep burrowing root, that supplies unique sugars needed in stabilizing blood sugar levels within their bodies. Without this they suffered a form of diabetes. Most if not all examples of gnome slavery as a form of drug culture, faded into obscurity, until Marilyn heard of an unscrupulous quack doctor from America who was purported to have one in his possession. In 1858, Marilyn traveled to New York and frequented many brothels and opium houses in search of this man. He found him at Madame LaRouge's secret garden. Before him a cage, and cowering in the corner of which, 
its body covered in scars from its master's cruel hand, was a living homunculi. Marilyn searched the gentleman's belongings, and found a large medical bag, within which were many faux potions, bottles of arsenic and doping elixirs. Yet the most disturbing items were the two large glass jars containing what appeared to be women's utility. Marilyn dropped the man, took the bag and picked up the cage. He left and caught the fastest steamer back to England. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos. Marilyn Cryptid Museum Part 6, Dromaeosaur. 1912, the Royal Institute for Paleontological Research received news of a unique find in the Varkyansk Range, eastern Siberia. The letter did not state what the find was, yet it intrigued the Russian-born head of the department, Aletsky Zukovsky, who was planning a trip to Russia that spring to visit colleagues. The find came with a price tag, and upon replying to the sender, he assured that payment would be made in full if the find was as rare as purported. When he reached Siberia, he found out that there was competition for the find, as letters had been sent to a number of scientific bodies. Intrigued further by this news, he put together a team of scientists and travelled to Lena, where they met a group of locals who had taken them to the site of the auspicious find. They had managed to beat the other parties to the find, yet for an hour the owner and his hired hand, a Pavnuti Shabishev, demanded payment before the find was shown to the party. Eventually, Alexei paid the man only to be confronted with something that challenged everything he knew of Saurian evolutionary biology. Before him, a creature that had been removed from the ancient permafrost of a subterranean mountain glacier some 40 miles north in a unique spot of almost permanent sub-zero temperatures. Preserved almost perfectly intact, although it was obvious that it had gone through many defrosting and refreezing processes, was an animal that would elevate many scientific theories, a perfect still image taken almost 65 million years before. The creature was a subspecies of the Ornithosaurus of the family Dromaeosauride, an order of bird-like theropod dinosaurs. They were small carnivores that flourished in the Cretaceous period. A few scientists have theorized that these animals were the precursor of birds, the strongest evidence being that the Archaeotheryx, discovered in 1861, only two years after Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, and it became a key piece of evidence in the debate over evolution. The specimen itself was not fossilized but preserved. Aletsky hypothesized that the initial freezing must have sterilized the creature of all microbial bacteria, ceasing all decomposition, and the final resting place of the animal in a frozen underground river had allowed, beyond all reason, a perfectly preserved form. Its body was covered in down, which formed protofeathers at the wrists, concealing three fingered digits tipped with razor sharp claws. Nearly every feature of the animal was intact, from eyes to the pigmentation in its skin. Dull reds and browns ascended the tiny creature, the evolutionary missing link between the dinosaur and the bird. The find was taken back to England and a post-mortem was carried out. The creature's stomach and digestive tract still contained its last meal, and it was found to contain high levels of salt. Once Zaleski had time to analyse the animal, he surmised that for an animal to be so well preserved after such a long time, it must have remained in a vacuum-like state. The salt was attributed to seawater, yet the unique conditions in which the animal had existed was never fully understood. To secure the stability of its fragile body, it was injected with various preservatives and given pride of place in the lobby of the Institute for Scientific Discourse. He remained there for a few months until the story of the plateau in South America became headline news. Alexei was invited to see similar specimens brought back from this place that time forgot. Many now believe that the Ornithosaur had actually originated from the plateau and not a subterranean glacier, yet how it managed to end up in Siberia was never explained. The story and the specimen remain a mystery and disappeared into the annals of time. Hidden in the storage facility of the Institute returned to the crate it was originally shipped in, along with the original customs and excise forms, a handful of illustrations and photos, and the various detritus that was attached to it once defrosted. 100 years later, Mongolia will be the site of hundreds more fossilized dromaeosaurs and other feathered dinosaurs, the final missing pages in the development of flight. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos.